Okay, our, our last river basin is going to be the uh, it's going to be the Potomac River Basin, um, and it turns out the Potomac River is my favorite river. So that's the, that's one reason uh, that we'll be uh, we'll be ending with uh, uh, with the Potomac River Basin. It turns out there are also some uh, some very interesting and important stories that uh, that concern uh, development and regulation of river basins. Um, a, another nice uh, reason to end. Uh, with the Potomac River Basin is uh, we've talked about a lot of uh, stories of development of river basins that haven't uh, always have positive, positive elements. We're going we're to end uh, with, uh, with almost uh, uniformly good stories uh, in the Potomac River Basin. Um, so the Potomac River, my favorite, uh, Great Falls right at the uh, just upstream of Washington, D.C., one of the many beautiful locations uh, in the Potomac River Basin. Um, this is a map of the Potomac River Basin, and just for orientation, um, a, a few important features. Uh, the, the Potomac River Basin above Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. is going to play uh, a central role in a number of the stories. Um, it's got a drainage area of about uh, 12,000 square miles. Uh, it's a tributary to Chesapeake Bay, and at Point Lookout, the drainage area is about, uh, about 16,000 square miles. Um, it, it's a complicated basin, and from some of the political uh, issues that we've looked at throughout the course, it's, it's not an obvious candidate for, uh, uh, for positive stories about river basin management. It, it's complicated by virtue of the fact that we've got a number of states to contend with, uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, Maryland, uh, the District of Columbia, and, and the District of Columbia turns out to be uh, particularly important because, well, the federal government is there, um, and the Potomac River is the water supply source for the uh, for the Potomac <coughs> River. And in fact, it turns out uh, that uh, shortly after the Civil War, uh, Congress gave the Corps of Engineers uh, a mandate to ensure drinking water for the operation of the federal government. Uh, one of the little political stories, but it, it's one that brings not only the District of Columbia, uh, but a direct federal uh, presence into uh, the picture of, 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 of management uh, of water in the Potomac River Basin. Um, so the Potomac's a tributary to Chesapeake Bay, and uh, some of the stories that we're going to deal with concerning the Potomac River Basin uh, are stories uh, with broader context, and the context um, really is the, the, the environment uh, of Chesapeake Bay. What I've shown here um, is just the positioning of Chesapeake Bay. The Potomac River Basin above uh, Washington, D.C. is the second largest tributary to uh, to Chesapeake Bay. Well, the Susquehanna extending all the way up into, uh, into New York is the largest. Uh, the Potomac is about a third the contribution uh, that the Susquehanna is. The other main contribution is from the James River in the south. Uh, so for Chesapeake Bay, we've got uh, the Susquehanna really forming the head uh, of Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac draining into the central portion of the bay, uh, and then the James providing the uh, the discharge uh, and the, the water and sediment and dissolved material uh, that constitute the lower uh, uh, inflow into Chesapeake Bay. So Chesapeake Bay, uh, in particular the environment uh, of Chesapeake Bay, will be one of the stories that we are concerned with. Now, uh, the Chesapeake Drainage Basin, just a, a slightly different look at the Chesapeake Drainage Basin, I just want to fix a few ideas uh, about the area you probably, well, the basin boundary is actually on here for the Chesapeake Bay, extending up into New York. Um, so the Potomac here draining the central portion. Uh, the, the point I'd like to make, green here is essentially uh, forested regions. The sort of tan colors uh, are by and large uh, agricultural. And for point of reference, uh, in, the, in the Potomac River Basin, the Shenandoah Valley, uh, which in its northern extension is called the Great Valley or the Lebanon Valley, um, is one of the important physiographic uh, elements of not just the Potomac River Basin, uh, but, uh, but of, the, of the Chesapeake Bay. So we've got a, we've, we've got a forested region uh, 
in the Chesapeake Bay principally, with sort of this central core of agriculture, a bit more in the Valley and Ridge provinces up in uh, Pennsylvania and a bit in the coastal plains uh, of Maryland and Virginia, uh, but principally forest, uh, some cores of agriculture, and then there's, it's kind of hard, they're, 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 they're black shading here uh, for the Washington metropolitan area, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Richmond. So we've got this corridor uh, of uh, urban development, and this corridor is really along the fall line. So Great Falls that we looked at at the beginning uh, is an area um, uh, with large slope, and it's the boundary between, uh, between bedrock uh, uh, landscape and coastal plain sediments. Um, and it's very important because it's the head of navigation of most of the Atlantic draining rivers. Uh, and in fact, most of the large urban areas in the East Coast form along, uh, form along the, uh, uh, the fall line. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a diverse region. Uh, it's a beautiful region. Um, just going to take a look at uh, the Shenan Shenandoah Valley with the Blue Ridge and the, uh, the Valley and Ridge uh, to the west. I'm just going to take a quick look. Uh, at that area. This is, um, this is a, uh, a space shuttle photograph of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, and there are all, all sorts of really interesting, wonderful things about the uh, Potomac River. I just want you to focus on, on just one neat thing about the river. Uh, so here's the North Fork of the Shenandoah, uh, the South Fork of the Shenandoah, actually I got it reversed, South Fork of the Shenandoah, North Fork, uh, this, these are the Massanutten Mountains, the Blue Ridge up here. Now the river is actually flowing due north, so north heads this way. The thing that's really neat about the Shenandoah is, can you see these meanders in the river? These really tremendous meanders in the river. And they're even uh, more pronounced in the North Fork of the Shenandoah. So these really large amplitude meanders in the river. So why in the world is, uh, you know, does the river go about doing that? That's one of the, uh, of the wonderful things about the Potomac River is it has uh, all of these interesting features um, where the, the, the landscape uh, really controls the way, um, uh, the way the river behaves. And if you want to know why, uh, why it meanders like that, uh, come see me after class and I'll tell you. Um, another uh, aspect of the Potomac River Basin is that, um, well, uh, it's known, it's been known for many years as the nation's river, and indeed it has played um, a central role in uh, many aspects of the nation's history. Quite often, indirectly, here is evidence by the, by the Fairfax Stone. Now, the Fairfax Stone was initially surveyed uh, in 1746 by a young surveyor uh, named George Washington, and the reason for this survey was that uh, Lord Baltimore uh, had deed to all of the lands north of the Potomac to its most headward extent. And Lord Fairfax then had uh, deed to the lands to the south of the possessions of Lord Baltimore. But uh, what were they? I mean, the, you know, they lived right on the, uh, the, the, the settlements were, uh, were, were on the, uh, very close to the, uh, to the Atlantic uh, in the 18th century. No one knew what was out here. Uh, and so surveys were required, and, and Washington was uh, part of the survey team that, that really uh, decided what would become uh, Maryland, that is the possession of Lord Baltimore, and what would become Virginia, uh, currently the two states of West Virginia and Virginia. Uh, this marks, it turns out the Fairfax Stone was stolen in the 1920s, and this is a replica of the Fairfax Stone. <laughs> <coughs> But that's, uh, that is an unimportant detail. Um, the, the important thing is that George Washington never told a lie. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, he did. He did. And the, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, Lord Baltimore is supposed to get um, all of the land north of the Potomac to its most headward extent. Well, you know, so what Washington, who of course is a Virginian, or will become a Virginian, um, he put the Fairfax Stone right here, okay, in the north branch of the Potomac River. So here goes the Potomac. Well, um, the, the most headward extent of the Potomac River is way down in the south branch of the Potomac here. 
So if someone tells you George Washington never told a lie, he certainly stretched the truth quite a bit here. Um, that's one aspect. The, the other aspect uh, that turns out to be important for, uh, for our water stories uh, to the end of the 20th century is one little detail of the deed to Lord Baltimore. And that is that he owned all the land uh, north of the Potomac River to its most headward extent and one important clause, including the Potomac River. Uh, Barbara Mikulski, the senator for Maryland, when she crosses the bridge from Virginia to Maryland, when she hits the bridge, she's proud to say that she is in Maryland. Maryland owns the river, and that turns out, that'll turn out to be an important part of uh, the story of managing the Potomac River. Um, like uh, so many of the stories that we've looked at, the Potomac has, uh, has many stories that, uh, that pertain to extreme floods. Uh, this is a story that, uh, or, or an image here that, um, that in many ways should be somewhat familiar to you. This is a, a picture of the Potomac in flood in January of 1996. Um, it's a flood peak, uh, and in fact the picture now is taken very close to the peak, uh, uh, 300,000 cubic feet per second in 1996. Now, uh, you, did a, you, did, you did a discharge computation, velocity unit stream power computation from the flood of record uh, in the Potomac. And in fact, it was taken from the very same bridge, uh, the discharge measurement, the current meter measure, measurements as this picture was taken. Uh, that was at 460,000 cubic feet per second, the March 19, 1936 uh, flood peak, which is the largest peak discharge in the Potomac, uh, in the Potomac River. Um, so this is kind of the way, this is pretty close to the way the river looked uh, under the conditions uh, for which you uh, carried out that discharge computation. Uh, so big floods are, big floods are you know, a fascinating topic in the Potomac River, but it turns out it's not the, it's not the central topic today. And the, the, the central topic is really the other end uh, of, the, of the hydrology side, and that's too little water. This is, uh, these are two photographs uh, taken from Chain Bridge as well, the exact same spot. Um, and one is taken in September of 1966, uh, the low picture here, which is black and white, and then the top, uh, July of 1999. Uh, the flow in both, uh, uh, for both pictures is around 600 cubic feet per second. And these are close to the minimum uh, discharges recorded in the Potomac River. Uh, in 1934, uh, the Potomac River reaches a discharge uh, close to what it uh, reached, minimum discharge, in 1966 uh, and 1996. So our stories here will really revolve more around, um, around too little water uh, than too much water. We'll come back to, uh, to too much water at the very end in, uh, in, a, in a somewhat new context. Um, our, our first picture was Great Falls. This is the way Great Falls uh, looks uh, when there is hardly anything going over. So the same time, you know, the first picture was at normal flow at, at Great Falls. This is the 1999 image, the 1966 image. So 600 cubic feet per second uh, to 460,000 cubic feet per second. That's kind of the range over which the uh, the Potomac River works. Um, this is, uh, is an image that I took from a briefing that Bob Hirsch presented to the uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, Congressional Delegation uh, on July 18, 1999. Uh, Bob Hirsch is the chief hydrologist of the U.S. Geological Survey, so he's the, he's the present day uh, antecedent uh, to uh, John Wesley Powell. Um, and what's shown here is um, both the way the Potomac River uh, at Washington, D.C. normally behaves and the way it behaved in 1998 and 1999. And it illustrates some of the important aspects uh, of, uh, of low flow in the Potomac River. Now one final bit of context before I tell you what, uh, what's really important here. Um, the, the final point of context is that um, we're interested in how low the Potomac River gets because Washington, D.C. and the Washington metropolitan area rely uh, on the Potomac River for their water supply. 
And that's kind of the bottom line, is what uh, the Potomac River uh, provides historically has been what the, the Washington metropolitan area has uh, for all aspects of, uh, of water use. Now, um, what the Geological Survey was, uh, was showing to the Mid-Atlantic Congressional Delegation is, is, a, a, is a representation of how bad things looked um, in, on July 18, 1999. Now, how bad? The, the gray area here um, shows uh, nor the normal flow range of the river. And normal, uh, the, the bottom end of normal is just the flow that succeeded 75% of the time and the top end is the flow that succeeded 25% of the time. Uh, so this is about 50% of the, of the discharge values at that, that time. And right in the middle is the median discharge. This is a good way to think about sort of normal flow. Now you see these big oscillations. Well, uh, we're in fact looking over two years, uh, plus one uh, October, November, additional October, November, uh, December period. Uh, an important, a, a really important aspect uh, of water supply for the Potomac River is this seasonal side. And in fact, it turns out to be a really important aspect of the way the Corps of Engineers uh, regulated river basins in the eastern United States uh, for water supply uh, and for water quality purposes. And we'll have to see how that, uh, why that's the case. So what are the, what are the numbers here? Let me show you, uh, just tell you what a few are. Uh, if you look in September, the flow that succeeded 75% um, um, of the time is about 1,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, we know the minimum is, is around 600 cubic feet per second. The largest value is 3,000. Uh, the flow that succeeded 25% uh, of the time is 3,000 uh, during the dry season. Now, uh, in March, the minimum flow, or the flow that succeeded 75% uh, of the time is 7,000 cubic feet per second. And the minimum flow in March, in 100 years of stream flow records, uh, is larger than 2,000 cubic feet per second. So this is a really strong uh, seasonal cycle to the way the Potomac River behaves. And that's going to be, that's going to turn out to be an important way uh, 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 of figuring out how to manage uh, uh, water resources in the Potomac River Basin. Now, um, in July 1999, in fact, on the 18th, on the 15th, uh, the Potomac River reached a discharge of 600 cubic feet per second upstream of withdrawals. Now, here, if you could look very closely, you can see it's down to 200 cubic feet per second. Now, that includes uh, uh, almost all of the withdrawals that are taken from the river uh, for water supply for Washington, uh, D.C. As it turns so out. So where's this gauge at? This gauge is actually right at uh, Chain Bridge, uh, close to Chain Bridge. The location is upstream of the Washington, D.C. area proper. Uh, it's downstream of the location where most of the withdrawals are made for the Washington metropolitan area. Um, so uh, you know we're down to record low levels. Um, and one of the things to note here is that um, in 1999, um, the, the story was similar to 1990, 1966 and similar to 1934. It, it was similar in one fundamental way. It was preceded by a very, very dry year. So looking the preceding year, particularly um, over the late summer, fall, early winter period, uh, we had near record low flows. So the time period when, uh, when, uh, when sort of vegetation shuts down and is not uh, evaporating away all of that precipitation that you get, uh, the Potomac River Basin didn't have the type of recharge that would have it positioned uh, in the spring to, to, to uh, be able to um, overcome deficit precipitation. So one side of droughts is that under, unlike, uh, unlike floods, these are slow breaking uh, events um, and the time scale that is important for droughts is going to be not just uh, months, but in uh, the case of the Potomac River Basin, the interannual aspect of precipitation plays an important role. Um, now, the water supply problem for the Washington metropolitan area is going to be um, an important uh, aspect of what we want to look at today. 
Now, before I can tell you what the Washington water supply problem is, I need to tell you a little bit about how uh, water is withdrawn from municipal water supply in the region. And I, I decided to do that from this, this figure here. Um, the Potomac River flows right along this boundary between, well, Montgomery County and Loudoun County, Montgomery County and Fairfax, Prince George's and Fairfax County. You see the diamond that is the District of Columbia uh, plus the part that uh, Virginia never really gave them. Um, so the, uh, the area that we're looking at is the Washington, D.C. area proper and the Maryland and Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, so we've got the following, uh, we've got the following political jurisdictions uh, to worry about. We have the state of Maryland, we have the state of Virginia. Um, we have two principal counties in Maryland, uh, Montgomery and Prince George's, and mainly two counties to deal with uh, in Virginia, Loudoun County and Fairfax County. Uh, so these are the areas that are taking water from the Potomac, and then uh, two more, the District of Columbia and the federal government through the Corps of Engineers in providing water for the federal government. So those are the players uh, in the water supply problem. Now, um, it, it turns out that, um, that both Virginia and Maryland have some, uh, some resources separate from the Potomac. Uh, in, in Virginia, there is a reservoir on the Occoquan River, which is the boundary between Prince William and uh, Fairfax County. And in, um, in, in, the, uh, in the Maryland suburbs, uh, there is a small reservoir on the Patuxent River that provides some water for Maryland. We'll, we'll see how those, uh, those, uh, those um, reservoirs fit into the water supply picture. Um, Municipal water supply for Washington, D.C. Is, is the real problem. Uh, the, the thing I've, I, you know, I've just got to impress upon you is that uh, in running uh, a municipal water supply system, uh, you, you just can't, you, you can't have the system fail. Um, it's, not, it's not an option. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. You know, there's certainly, uh, there, there are big consequences to uh, uh, to commerce. Um, a, a big one, particularly in terms of cost, is public health. Because what happens if you, uh, uh, if you run out of water is the, is the distribution system loses pressure. And when the distribution system loses pressure, you've got real <coughs> potential for having pathogens enter your water distribution system. And the cost the cost of cleaning water uh, distribution systems are just astronomical. Um, so this is kind of the second thing. But the bottom line is you just cannot lose pressure in water distribution systems. Every time uh, it's happened in major urban areas, uh, there have been disastrous consequences. And this is the, this is the real public health threat. Um, and so from the perspective of a water manager uh, of, a, of a large city, you know, they're really concerned about you know, making sure that, uh, that everyone has drinking water. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's a big concern. Uh, but the bottom line is you've got to keep pressure uh, for fire protection. Okay, so um, it means you've got to think about water supply sort of in, the, in this context uh, that we thought about. Um, you, know, you can't have reservoirs, uh, uh, dams failing. Water supply systems are very, very similar. The, the consequences are, are uh, such that they're very, very difficult uh, to even contemplate bearing. So now, uh, the picture then is that for Washington, D.C., uh, we've, we've basically got uh, an unregulated river. Uh, this, is the, this is going to be the, the story when we look at it in the 1970s. Um, now there, are no, there are no major dams that provide uh, a water supply source for the region. Now, um, here's the Occoquan River. So there's a little uh, reservoir here that provides drinking water for a portion of uh, the Virginia suburbs. And then right to the uh, east of the Potomac River Basin is the Potomac is a Patuxent River, uh, which provides uh, a supply that can meet a fraction of the, uh, of the requirements for the, for the Maryland suburbs. 
Okay, so what is the Washington water supply problem, at least uh, looking at it from the, from the viewpoint of the 1970s? Um, I've sort of summarized it in, in, in numbers. Um, and one side is uh, how much do you need? And by the 1970s, the average daily demand for the Washington metropolitan area um, has reached 500 million gallons per day. In 1977, during the summer of 1977, um, demands exceed 700 million gallons per day. Now I switch now to water supply units and discharge is going to be the same way. Water managers think in terms of million gallons per day. So this is, uh, this is what we need and this is what we have. From the perspective of a uh, of a water manager in the metropolitan area, uh, what they count on from the Potomac River, what they view as the reliable yield is 400 million gallons per day. That's basically the 600 million gallons per day that they've seen in 1966 and they've seen in 1934. So this is basically the minimum historical flow of the, uh, of the Potomac River in the 1970s. Now the Virginia Reservoir uh, it's going to give you about 50 million gallons per day, as is the Maryland Reservoir. So the problem is fairly clear. Even by the 1970s, uh, you've seen days in which the um, demand far outstrips uh, supply under, uh, under sort of minimum supply scenarios. And, and you've got to take it in that context of, well, we, you know, we just can't, we can't have that transpire. That's not an option. Okay, so that's, in the 1970s, this is viewed um, as, um, as the burning uh, problem for water management in the, uh, in the region. Okay, and the water supply problem for D.C., this is a 1970s perspective. Uh, the problem was uh, identified uh, shortly after World War II. The demand in the Washington metropolitan area would lead to conditions uh, in which the supply of the Potomac River would be inadequate. Um, and uh, the Corps of Engineers is ready to go. Um, so in the 1950s, they uh, went through a 308 planning activity for the Potomac River Basin, um, and they're ready to solve uh, the water supply problem for Washington, D.C. So we're going to look back now at something of the history uh, of how the water supply problem was dealt with. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, deals with that project through their 308 report uh, with a recommendation for 16 major dams and reservoirs uh, in the Potomac River Basin. Um, this would include uh, three major dams in the Shenandoah River Basin alone, um, several in the North Branch and South Branch. Um, it would include two mainstream dams on the Potomac River itself. This is an enormous uh, construction project, even in the context of the uh, of those that we've seen so far in the uh, development of other river basins. Now, uh, in 1977, um, they reduce their proposals for uh, the Potomac River Basin to six major dams and reservoirs, and someone uh, uh, gave it the name the Six Pack Proposal. Um, so 1977, six major dams and reservoirs. Um, one point I uh, emphasize here is even in 1977 dollars, the costs are very, very large. Uh, one to two billion dollars uh, are the estimates for the cost for these six major dams and reservoirs. Uh, now, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that we dropped from 16 to six uh, turns out to be the Clean Water Act uh, in uh, 1969. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, forever signaling the Potomac River to be the nation's river uh, pronounced um, in 1965 uh, that he would clean up the Potomac River uh, and within 10 years he would swim in it. Um, you know, recognizing that he wasn't likely to live that long and never had, would have to uh, fulfill that, which he didn't, unfortunately. Uh, but Johnson made the Potomac the nation's river, um, and in 65, 
uh, the Potomac River was really the, uh, the model that was used in creating uh, the legislation for the Clean Water Act, which created the EPA, and our current uh, mechanisms for regulating water quality in the nation's rivers. Um, one of the most important aspects of that legislation um, is the way it described remedies for water quality problems, and particularly what it said could not be remedies, and that was, uh, that was uh, cast as a slogan uh, or an anti-slogan. Uh, the solution to pollution cannot be dilution. Um, previously, the approach to dealing with uh, requests for additional uh, discharges of raw sewage into a river uh, was to permit these if sufficient dilution could be provided. Um, so dilution from impoundments was the mechanism by which uh, you allowed for, uh, for additional uh, discharges of pollutants into rivers. The Clean Water Act said, can't do that. Uh, you cannot uh, use dilution as a, as a tool for remedying water quality problems. Um, well, it turns out of, of these 16 uh, dams, uh, about 40% of the total storage capacity was for water quality dilution and development of, uh, uh, of the region, You're thinking of development in terms of additional uh, uh, pollution input to the streams. So right uh, with the Clean Water Act, about 40% uh, of the storage decreases. The Corps decides that they can reduce uh, the needs for, uh, uh, for water supply storage beyond what they envisioned uh, in the 1950s, and that gets us down to the six dams. Um, uh, the story ends uh, with, uh, with Jennings Randolph Dam. One of them is built, and it's, it's an important one because it's the, end of our, it's the end of our federal dam story. This is the last federal dam. Um, Jennings Randolph Dam. And uh, we're going to have to look at it more closely. Uh, so of the 16 and then of the 6, one's finally built and it's so different from the other 16 and the other 6. One of the fundamental problems is that um, that was faced in the 1960s uh, that really wasn't faced uh, at the time Tigert or, or Kenzua uh, were designed uh, is that you had solutions to a Washington problem imposed on uh, Shenandoah Valley farmers. Uh, and in the 1930s, uh, Tigert Valley farmers went along with that. In the 1960s, uh, Shenandoah Valley farmers didn't, nor did they do that in the South Branch uh, of the Potomac. Um, so dams no longer, uh, particularly dams that provided benefits uh, to other regions, uh, they were contested, and they were contested uh, on political, uh, in the political arena, and those contesting um, well, were the victors in the, in the 1970s. Jennings Randolph turns out to be different, and it turns out to be our big Corps of Engineers success story, uh, and uh, we need to get to that success story, uh, because it sort of, it, 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 um, it paints uh, a bright future for the Corps of Engineers in terms of the types of, uh, of problems that they can solve. We'll come back to that. All right, now here's sort of a long list. The Washington Water Supply Solution. Ah, uh, okay, now, let me just, so the 30s and the uh, 1934, 1966 just, you know, just tells us how bad things can be uh, in the Potomac River and relying on the unregulated Potomac River. So this is, this is really our, um, our, our background um, for deciding this, that we've got a problem um, and we've got to come up with, uh, with additional sources if we're going to have uh, the area expanding. Um, the solution turns out to be um, a series of agreements called the Cooperative Water Supply Agreements. Cooperative Water Supply Agreements. And they do, they do a number of things, and they involve a number of parties. Um, these agreements are between um, the counties in the Washington metropolitan area, Montgomery County, Prince George's, Fairfax, uh, and Loudoun County. They're party to these agreements. The states, uh, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania are parties to these agreements. The District of Columbia, the governor of the District of Columbia, are party to these agreements. Um, and the federal government, through its responsibility for providing drinking water, is 
uh, as part of the agreement. And what they provide is funding for the Jennings Randolph Dam. So this dam has gone through planning, they're ready to go, and so they provide, uh, the dam is entirely paid for uh, from, uh, from local funds, the water supply portion of the dam. Okay, so in part it's uh, providing money for that, and it's a 13 billion gallon water supply facility. Um, little Seneca Dam is also provided for, it's just a little tiny dam that's right in the Washington metropolitan area. Okay, so that's also provided for. Um, the final, uh, or the two other things that are provided for um, is uh, through the states, the uh, counties, the federal government, and the District of Columbia agree uh, to draft uh, a document that will preserve water quality in the Potomac River below Washington, D.C. So in addition to solving the water supply problem, they did not divorce it from uh, water quality problems. And that agreement um, is a low flow allocation agreement. So these parties look at not just water supply, but they also looked at the broader picture uh, of water management. Um, so these are the, these are the ingredients. One f the one final one um, is that uh, they're going to operate this dam and this dam in a novel way, very different from the way the Corps of Engineers uh, typically thinks of water supply projects. Now, uh, a couple of uh, asides. In 1983, this wins the American Society of Engineers uh, um, Outstanding Engineering Prize. Uh, and it, it's really under the, even though it involves two dams, uh, the, the citation is for non-structural solutions to water supply problems. So the, the, the ingredient that comes into play here is instead of six dams at $2 billion, we've got a $200 million dam, we have a $20 million dam, and they are jointly managed uh, for water supply. So we've, we've thrown out a um, billion or so dollars in construction costs by efficient management. And that's what the American Society of C uh, Civil Engineers identified as the, the uh, the most important engineering contribution uh, of, this, uh, of this set of agreements and the management procedures that follow. And then I'll just note, in 1999, uh, dams were completed in 81, 82. The first water supply releases are, are made during the drought of 1999. So up until that time, uh, this dam's been, uh, and the storage has been used. The first severe drought is 1999. Uh, it does the job just fine. Okay, so that's the picture now. So we've got a dam on a 200 square mile catchment in the north branch of the Potomac. Uh, and we've got a dam right in Seneca Creek, which is just upstream of Washington, D.C. Instead of 16 or six major dams uh, uh, over the Potomac River Basin, we've got one that everyone wants up here uh, and one that's, uh, that in fact has strong local support here and is for local water supply uh, here. That's part of the solution. Uh, this is Jennings Randolph Dam uh, under construction. Uh, the spillway, and what turns out to be uh, particularly important is the, uh, is the intake tower. We'll come back to that. Now, and this is the, this is the idea that, you know, that we have to think about. Uh, safe yield turns out to be the way the Corps of Engineers um, figured out, it's the notion that they used to figure out how many reservoirs they needed. So what the safe yield of a reservoir, so now we're thinking of a storage capacity, and, and you know, think 13 billion gallons. You've got 13 billion gallons and a river flowing into it, you know, providing you what it will. The safe yield of the river is the maximum release that you can make on a constant basis uh, and never run out of water. That's the safe yield. So it's a constant release, day in, day out, um, and never run out of water. And the way they compute this is they, they use the Geological Survey's discharge data. And uh, for the North Branch of the Potomac, they had um, 60 years of discharge data. 
and they sort of, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of envision how you go through that computation. You know, they, uh, you know, they started out, uh, you started out full, uh, you empty, you say, well, can I do 100 million gallons per day? You know, you take 100 out, you put whatever comes in from the stream flow record, and you just keep going until you run out. Well, if you run out, you have to lower it. Okay, so you can think about how, um, how, you, would, uh, how you would code up uh, that algorithm. Well, if you do it for Jennings Randolph, you come up with 67 million gallons per day. Okay, and that's the way the Corps of Engineers, uh, that's the number that they attached to this dam. And now, um, we've got 400 million gallons per day from the, um, from the uh, Potomac River. And let's say we want to allow Washington, D.C. to expand to a demand of 800 million gallons per day. Well, we need, a f another f you know, we need another 400 million gallons per day. So if you take six of these, Eureka, that's what you wind up with. Okay. So that's the six pack. Does this make sense? Now, are, are, are we back to the Tiger Dam and the spillway? I mean, is this the way, is that with, uh, with this dam, do we really have, uh, is that all we can do? Okay, now, now we need to go back. Uh, right, remember, the idea here is that every day, day in, day out, you know, you're going to, you know, 67 million gallons per day is going out, uh, out the dam. You know, why in the world are you, are you doing that in March when the, the lowest flow you've ever seen in the Potomac River is, uh, um, is greater than 1,000 million gallons per day? In fact, that's the case uh, for five out of 12 months. They've never seen flows that low. Okay, so that's a, you know, that has nothing to do with how the water would be used. Now, the way you would use the water is, you know, by golly, when you got down here and you were short, or you have the potential for being short, you're, you'll make a release. Okay, that's the, that's the way you're going to actually operate the, uh, the reservoir. Well, if you, do, uh, if you do that, the only problem you've got with this reservoir, uh, with this Jennings Randolph Dam, is that it's way out in western, uh, uh, western Maryland. And in fact, it's six days from the time you make a release until the water winds up in the District of Columbia. The way the, uh, the co-op water supply agreements set up management is that you make releases from Jennings Randolph when the forecast six days ahead says that you're going to need additional water. So you make that. Well, you know, bad things can happen. You can, you can fall short. So what you need is you just need something to top it up. And that's, the, uh, that's this, uh, this little reservoir down by Washington, D.C. You don't need much up from it. All you need is you need to be able to, to top things up um, if you come up short. So the design, uh, instead of having six dams at one to two billion dollars, you've got one at around 200 million dollars, uh, and you're really focusing on efficient management of that resource. Okay, so in that case, what you wind up with is, um, um, is a capability to get to 99, get through a severe drought in 99 with no problems. In fact, um, the current assessment is the Washington water supply uh, is, uh, could provide demands up close to 1,000 million gallons per day. Now the other story, and um, uh, a Corps of Engineers story that's, uh, that really points to some uh, important things that could be done in the future, um, is that uh, th this, this place where they put the dam, the North Branch of the Potomac River, well, it was a, it was a dead river in the 1970s. Uh, it is a very, very poor region, uh, and it's an area with a number of abandoned mines. Uh, the river is dead, pH less than four, uh, bad condition. Now, uh, 1990s, it's different. In fact, now, uh, downstream of the dam, there's an important recreational fishery. The lake itself is used as a fishery, um, so there's been this dramatic uh, turnaround, and it's really this, this tower designed by the Corps of Engineers. If you recall, acid mine drainage was identified as a problem in the Tigert, uh, but the part, of the part of the problem they faced there is they could only make withdrawals from one place in the river. And if it had bad water, you know, you're, you're sort of out of luck. Uh, bad water goes down. 
And what the Corps of Engineers figured out they could do uh, is if you make, and this is uh, their schematic drawing of that um, withdrawal tower, is if you have ports for withdrawing water throughout the depth of the reservoir, well, you know, effectively what you can do is you can just mix that stuff up. Most of the time, water quality is good. Um, and what you need to do is you just need to uh, mix the good with the bad. And that works out pretty well because this is a very deep lake. Um, it's 150 feet at the base of the dam. Um, it stratifies in temperature and it stratifies in pH. So what the Corps of Engineers was able to do is design water quality management strategies uh, where they can have a target pH downstream and they can keep pH uh, uh, above a, uh, a specified level. Um, so an important uh, aspect of this dam was very innovative management for water quality. Um, now another aspect, of the, the low flow allocation agreement said that um, you had to, you know, you take everything out uh, for water supply, there still has to be 100 million gallons per day uh, passing the river, uh, passing Washington, D.C. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of important, um, recognizing the, uh, the contribution that, uh, that water quality operations uh, play. But what really turned out to be important was an authorization to use water supply water for augmentation of water quality when it wasn't needed. Most years you knew. Uh, most years aren't like 1999. You'd say we don't need uh, any of this 13 billion gallons. So we talked about uh, flushing releases uh, from Glen Canyon Reservoir. Uh, the Corps of Engineers was doing precisely this in the Potomac River in the 1980s. Uh, water quality uh, releases uh, to address specific habitat uh, considerations. Um, so the, um, the management uh, of water resources in the Potomac River, um, it really only involved uh, uh, a dam on a 200 square mile catchment, not much from a 12,000 square mile drainage basin. Um, the most important side of management and water supply here is that uh, the political uh, and the institutional elements uh, came together to provide uh, an efficient management strategy that dealt with water supply issues, that dealt with water quality issues, uh, and provided a, a way to, of looking to the future uh, for water management and drainage basins. Okay, see you on Tuesday, and we will, we will